All right, so uh, into the network folder, I just put some new items. I'm going to be putting these items, uh, these PDFs that are going to be numbered. So uh, Campus Mobile Apps Dev 2, How To 0, 1, and 2. And there'll be more handouts that I put in here. So step 0 that I've got here, set yourself up. Set up your station. Um, looking at that handout, um, let me... Let me look at that one first. As I said again, you're going to need to set up some things whenever you come into class because we have deep freeze. All along, we've had this software running right here. Uh, you probably see a little polar bear that's been staring at you the whole time. And that's deep freeze. That's software, I believe I've said before, that it locks the computer to our certain factory settings. So every time you restart the computer, it goes back to our factory settings. Well, that's good and bad. It's good because if we get a virus on the computer, we basically restart it and it'll clean itself out to how it was. Well, that's bad because if you saved anything to the desktop, it'll be gone. That's also bad because right now I had to activate the driver to this thing, which I thought was already there. Well. I'm going to have to activate it again next time the computer restarts because I install the driver as long as the computer is on. And these get turned on and off every day. So you're going to need to reinstall. If you're going to use my device, you might need to reinstall the driver. If you're going to use your device, most likely you will have to reinstall the driver every time. And I'll get to how to use your device soon. But what I've got then set up here, here for instruction zero, one of the things you need to do every time you come in, besides the driver stuff, you need to sort of wake up Visual Studio. Uh, every time you come in, and I'll remind us the first couple of times, and then after that I expect you to do it on your own, but you're going to need to start Visual Studio, you're going to need to sign into your Microsoft account, and you're going to create a quick test project. Even though we're going to continue with CBDB very soon, I still recommend that every time you come in, create a quick test project and simply run it. Without making any changes, run it in the browser so that it wakes up the internals to run in the simulator. Then, if you're going to use devices, you're going to need to uh, install the driver every time you come in and then run it in the device every time. Once you do these two things every time you come in, then as I start the real lecture, this will go a lot faster. Because these first couple of times, it needs to download a bunch of supporting files and such. And this testing project that I ask you to create here, then you just close it. You don't need to save it or keep it or anything. It's just a way for us to wake up Visual Studio to prepare your computer for our development that day. I have these various links that I'm going to keep putting in most of the handouts. This is to further read more on using Visual Studio. So just very briefly, I'll look at the first one here. Visual Studio getting started. You don't have to click on it, but you know, you go here, you're going to see more videos, more documentation. How does it work? I want to learn even more. I have a lot of free time, so I'm going to follow that first link on my PDF, and then right here, how to use Apache Cordova to load a sample, do a tutorial, browse more documentations and more videos. So these handouts that I'm going to be giving you are going to have like the essence of what you need to do. The full details are going to be here, and we're going to look at some of these in detail as the class goes on, such as this very last one here, publishing to a store. Eventually, in part three of the class, we're going to have our, our app finished, and I want to put it on the real app stores. Well, eventually, we're going to go step by step from that instruction. I'll have a condensed version, but the one there officially is, is fully detailed and documented and straight from the horse's mouth and with pictures pointing to do exactly what you need to do. So these links that I have here, they're not like recommended reading. They're basically further reading. You should read those at some point. I will, of course, consolidate or distill these links, but you should still read those. So instruction zero is just what you need to do every time you come into class to set yourself up. Questions on that? We'll go to the next one. Questions on instruction zero? 
again a couple of the, the first couple of times we'll do it together so that uh, you kind of understand it and then after that uh, you'll need to do it on your own instruction one how to set a Visual Studio for mobile app development now this really I guess I should mark it at home this is already set up here because obviously you do not need to go to download Visual Studio right now it's here obviously you don't need to do this it's ready so I, I guess I should be obvious and say this how to do this at home so at home you would go to the website you would download it it may tell you you also need Microsoft.net so I tried to test this on a variety of computers and double check my handouts and they do change you know Microsoft changes this stuff once in a while so I, I believe all of these are the most current if something is different when you try it at home tell me so I can try to have an answer here for people but again I've taught this class for five years and I've seen the joys and the tragedies of people that it works or it doesn't work and for some people they struggle and then eventually it works for some people it work right away for some people unfortunately it never worked because your device is too old too compatible too weird and too much bad luck I don't know <laughs> but for 99 percent of people it works right Jack you've seen it before yes so it does work now when you're setting this up, Microsoft, uh, Visual Studio will ask you at home, what kind of apps do you want to create? You can select any of the ones that it lists you there, but then you'll be downloading like 100 gigabytes of data. The ones that we need for this class is mobile development with JavaScript. Again, it's already ready on our computers, but at home, you need to select that. Further, are you going to use real devices or virtual devices? You then select, I want to use this because I've got a real device I'll plug in, or I want to use a virtual device, so I need that. And depending on which of those you select, you're going to get somewhere between 2 to 4 to 20 gigabytes of data being downloaded. That's normal. That's what often happens when you work with big, powerful software. So this, you would do this at home. You would then launch it. It would then ask you to sign into your account which we did today, which you'll do at home. You can skip it, but it'll bug you again in 30 days. And again, it doesn't run out that you have to pay for it. It's just going to say, make sure you sign in to use the free software. Um, you just need the free Microsoft account. There's a little quick test here at home to make sure it works, which is what we did right now. Today, we created a project. We chose the JavaScript template using the blank Cordova template, we just did that. Call it whatever you want, save it wherever you want. Its name will be there, click OK. Page two. We saw that there's the, um, the possibilities in the toolbar here. Debug, um, what device and how to deploy. So eventually we're going to switch from debug to release. Right now our app is, is open, it's unencrypted, it's hackable, which we want that because we're still making our app. Eventually we'll set it to release where it'll compress and encrypt your project so it will not be readable. People will not be able to look at the source code of it. And then technically up here we have the ability then to deploy to Android, iOS, or Windows. Although unfortunately to get it to fully work on Windows, on iOS, you still need a Mac. You basically, and I have it on another instruction, you connect your Mac to a Windows computer and then you can communicate. It's kind of weird and complex. But I have it in another handout. That's why very easily for us in class, well, we're just going to select Android. I've got a classroom full of Androids, and whatever we're doing on our app in an Android environment is like 99% for iOS. And we've got the option to deploy to different devices and simulators here, and you can further get more complex emulators there, like, a, like a, um, an Android watch. You can download a simulator that will behave like those watches that no one cares about anymore. Or you can uh, get like an Android TV or a Fire Stick. So you can simulate all of these kinds of devices if you install more. Oh, we've got these ones built in. A G5 device, a tablet, 4 inch, or whatever. Or a real device. 
that's the explanation there. Click Run. On your own home computer, we, it didn't happen here because I've got it set up, but oftentimes what I see when you're running this for the first time in Windows, you might get an, an alert about your firewall. Well, I say here, of course, turn it on, let it access through your firewall. It's safe. And then go, Chrome will start up, and you can check Chrome and such, and then you stop it, and you go back to um, Visual Studio. This part then about deploying to a real device. How many of you brought a real Android device today? Your own device. Okay, cool. How many of you also remember to bring your cable for your device? Our cable might not work with your device because if you notice, this plug is a USB C device. It is the new futuristic round one, and my device is not compatible with that. So just because you've got a cable doesn't mean it's going to work on your device. So if you brought your own device and cable today, cool, you might be able to do this. If not, you can do this next time. That's why I've got a whole room full of devices for you to play with. But in general, let's look at my instructions here. In general, you're going to need to turn on developer mode. Um, and you're also going to need your specific drivers for your specific device. Maybe by clicking the little pop-up it might save you like it did on mine here. But oftentimes you're going to need to go to, your, to the Samsung website and download the driver for your Samsung phone. Or you might need to go to the Motorola website and download the Motorola driver for your Motorola phone. So we've got search online for OEM USB driver for your device, download it and install it to your computer. Now this is something that you might want to do on our computers, but again you'll need to do it every time you come to our class because of deep freeze. So that'll be again part of step zero that you need to do when you come to class. Install your driver if you want to use your device um, and uh, start Visual Studio and such. On, on these devices, like 99% of these Android devices, they are sold as a consumer device for regular people to do regular things. Web browsing, playing music, taking pictures. We want to use it as a developer, so we need to t turn on developer options. And most of the time, that developer screen is turned off because the, the manufacturer does not want you to accidentally break your system. So I've got here how to do that. And this doesn't jailbreak your device. This doesn't void, void your warranty. This doesn't do anything like that. It just turns on that special <clears throat> mode. But I've got here, in your device, you need to go to settings somewhere, somehow you go to settings. You're going to have a screen somewhere about, about the device, about your phone. It might say your tablet, your device, your phone, or something. We, we saw that a little while ago when I asked you to go to the screen here. I saw an About screen. And then it's going to have something like Build Number. Sometimes it's hidden also inside of Software Information. Inside of Software Information, I see Build Number, and I have to tap it seven times. And it'll give me a message saying, you're a developer now. So depending on your device, somewhere in the settings, and of course I'm happy to help you in class, but somewhere in your settings, you're going to need to tap seven times, and you're going to get a brand new option, Developer Options. And inside of Developer Options, in my notes here, I say, well, you're going to turn on USB debugging. It'll pop up to scare you to say, are you sure you want to turn this on? This could potentially mean that someone could install apps on your device without you knowing about it? Well, here's the one caveat I will say. It is perfectly fine to turn on and off developer mode. I would recommend if you're going to use your own device to go through the steps to turn it on in class. And then before you leave, go backwards and turn it off. You don't want to be in developer mode all the time because in theory, you could visit a bad website on your phone and it could install an, an app onto your phone without you knowing about it when you're in developer mode. So in class, turning it on and turning it off is what I would recommend. And I'll remind us 
at the end of the day. But that's what you've got to do to use your own device. You need to download the driver and install it to the computer. You need to tap it on your device seven times and turn on that mode. And then when you plug it in, it may further ask you to confirm the firewall access. You say allow. There may be a pop-up on your device that says, are you sure you want to connect? You'll have to turn that on. Sometimes if you don't turn that option fast enough, it'll say there were errors. You can cancel that, turn it on, run it again. And again, it's just so weird. Sometimes I see people do it one time, it doesn't work. They do it the second time the exact same way, quote unquote, and then it works. And sometimes I see people restart the computer, do it again, and then it works. So it, it will work. Don't get discouraged if it doesn't work right away. You saw for me, I expected it to work right away, and I had to um, get it to work, and it finally worked, and then it works. So in class, the only thing that you would need to do at some point if you want to use your device is download your driver. And then, it, and then our Visual Studio will probably work with your device. I do have to say, it does sometimes happen when people come in with a really cheap and cheap no-name Android device. It just doesn't work. You know, the great thing about Android is that it's open source, and any manufacturer can change it. The bad thing about Android is that it's open source, and any manufacturer can then change it. What that means is that some company might decide, well, we're going to change this option, and suddenly it's different than what we're doing in class. Or they may turn off a feature, and it's different from what I'm doing in class. And that's not my fault. Blame your manufacturer of your device. I'll try to help you as best as possible to set it up. But sometimes, the 1%, sometimes it just doesn't work. That's why I've got a whole classroom full of tablets. Yeah, exactly. An Apple device is not going to work because we need to connect an Apple phone to an Apple computer, which we don't have. So that's why we've got Android devices that are compatible. Yes? If you download Visual Studio on a Mac or a Visual Studio for Windows comes with Cordova, and on the Mac, I have to double check it, but I believe it also comes with it. If not, it may be an add-on to it. But again, this is unfortunately, uh, Apple does not make it that easy for people to make apps unless you do it their way. It's got to be on Mac hardware oftentimes with Xcode on their, on their software and with their device. And like I said, uh, as we'll do it again a little bit later, that it only costs uh, $25 to become an official uh, iPhone app developer, I mean Android app developer, and it costs $99 for a year for the Mac. So, you know, they're the 800-pound gorilla, and they decided to do it that way, and unfortunately then for us, it's annoying. <coughs> So, any questions here on this handout here? Handout number one. We'll have time to try this, of course, in a moment. Question? I cannot turn on the USB. No, I cannot change the target device from simulate um, in browser to device because everything is grayed here on mine, and then there is nothing on the side to get to the www. Do you have a little red square? If you have the red square, you're still simulating it, so you want to press stop.
All right, so uh, let's look at the next handout. At the moment, I put three handouts, and then I'll, uh, I'll have more for you, of course. But let's look at this one here, um, uh, number two. <coughs> so this is the anatomy of a Visual Studio Cordova project. Uh, we're going to further use Cordova, and I've been touching upon it, that Cordova is basically a JavaScript library that the short answer is it translates a website into an app, basically. So um, we're going to still use that. Uh, a Visual Studio project has a variety of pieces. Some of them we're going to work with a lot, and some of them not too much. Here's one thing that we want to look at. In your uh, project here, uh, you should see outside of the WW folder, you see a few files that are outside of a folder. They're in the root. And one of the important ones is config.xml. Go ahead and double click config XML. Config XML. In the Solution Explorer, you open this up. Each screen serves a purpose. So there are several screens here that further control your app. The config XML is like uh, a master file that defines various aspects of your, of your app. Uh, for example, toolset. We're currently using Cordova version 6.3.1. We can change the version of Cordova here, but we hardly ever do anything in this toolset screen. So don't really worry about what's there. And I have that on the notes here. Which version of Cordova? You almost never change it. OK. Common. Here's a very important screen here. This common screen has. What is the name of our app? What is the name that will appear below our icon? When we created this project, I said, let's call it test1. But if I wanted this to have a different name, I just change it here very easily. My amazing app. Don't change it, but we could. Exclamation point. So the name uh, that will appear below the icon will be there. So I'm not going to change it, but that's where you could change it. The very first screen that will load in our app, index.html. If I had a different screen called home.html, I would then, of course, change it. But it's common practice that the very first screen of a website is index.html. And therefore, here, the very first screen of our app is index.html. The locale here is English US. If this was going to be English in England, it would be ENUK. If it was going to be uh, English in Canada, it would be ENCA. You know, I don't have them all memorized, but if I wanted to do this in Spanish, it would be a, it would be S space MX. Spanish from Mexico versus Spanish from Spain. So there is a way here to change the language. We'll leave it, of course, English US. Package name. This is going to be different for everyone here, but it's io.cordova. whatever the name of your app. Gibberish. Mine is 13F328. Yours is something else, most likely. This package name, as I have here in the notes, is that we are going to have to uniquely identify ourselves in the app stores. You might have noticed there's more than one calculator app in the app store. There's more than one weather app. And they're all named weather. They're all named calculator. Well, what uniquely identifies one weather app from another weather app is this package name. And this is in a reverse, domain, reverse domain order. Let's delete what's here. Notice you get a little red message here saying there's something wrong on that screen. That's OK. And let's type com.yourlastname.test01. 
all of us right now have a project, an app, called Test01. And in theory, we could all upload our app to the App Store. However, all of our apps need a unique package name. <clears throat> so this is basically, if it were written as, as normal, test01.mylastname.com. That's a web address. But here it wants it in reverse, com dot your last name dot the name of your app, all in lowercase. But it's not really unique because it could be That's right, but I could be making an app called Calculator X. See how that's unique. This uniqueness here makes it different from these other Smiths. So the full unique package name is the whole part of it. Maybe I have .net, net.net.smith.test1. So for most of us, because our, our last names in here are unique from each other, that's good. And then when we go to the App Store, we'll have a unique name. But then further, the last part of it, my app is called you know, CVDB. Zero, 01 or whatever. Is this same thing just like emails when you create an email that you know that it exists somewhere else? Because why, by coincidence, somebody comes up with the same name as you? No, this doesn't detect it at this point. This will only detect it once we try to upload it to the App Store. Then the App Store will say, oh, that name's already taken. So unfortunately, this, this doesn't, this cannot check right now it won't check until we upload to the App Store but then we can change it once the App Store tells us that names already taken so this is basically a, a reverse domain name and this has got to be unique when we do this for real with our CBDB app well you're gonna have your last name here obviously you're not gonna use Smith you're not gonna use Campos you're gonna use your last name and then it will be unique from everyone else in the class um, so that'll be more important as we go on but this is what keeps your app unique from everyone else. Version. This is a completely arbitrary number here. This is version 1.0.0. As we work here, we could set this up that this, you know, today we're going to make our app, and then tomorrow I'm going to set it to version 1.1. And then next time it's going to be 1.2. You know, you can put numbers however you want here. It could be 1.0.1. What I often find pretty common is that people do, okay, version 1.1.201807, .1 what's today, 11? 10? Tomorrow's, oh, tomorrow's 7-11, we get free Slurpees. So that's a way here, 1.1.date. This number can be anything you want. I could be, up, I could be creating version 99.98.22. It'll say, great. These numbers don't really matter. They're for you, but I would probably want them to go in an order. I see this also. This is version 0 0.1.2018.711, or 7.10. That'll work too. I'm not ready to release my major version of my app yet, and I'm barely getting started with version 1 in today's date. When I work on this, you know, on Thursday, I could do... 0 0.1 dot Thursday. So whatever you want to use these numbers as. Keeping it very easy, we're just going to go with like normal numbers like this. 1.0.0. These next ones here are pretty self-explanatory. Author, your name here. Who's the person or company that created this? So just to play with this, uh, you can put your name or um, the name of your, your, your app development company. You technically don't need the official developer certificate from the app stores where you pay for it yet. You can become a, an app developer like this right away just by naming yourself here that this is my company, I'm making apps. There's no central repository that will reject or approve this. So this is me, this is the author, this is my app company. Or you can just put your name if you want. 
This description is, uh, again, to describe your app and the default here. A blank project that uses Apache Cordova to help you build an app that targets multiple platforms. Let's just say, uh, day one using Visual Studio for mobile apps. Or better yet, an actual description of what this app is, which is nothing because it's just a testing playground app. Eventually, this is the description that's going to be the description for CBDB. Uh, the number one app that you need to save your comics. Blah, blah, blah. Give it some verbiage. Here's something. I don't have the tablet plugged in, but I have at least once deployed it to the tablet. I press home to go home. I press the apps button to go look at all my apps. My app is there. Test01 is installed. Try it out. You know, unplug it. Uh, go to your apps. The app is installed on the device. It's a real app. You can put it on the home screen if you know how to do that. Tap and hold. So it is really installed. Now, if you haven't tried this, the app is installed, and if I go landscape, it tilts to landscape. It reorients itself vertical or landscape orientation. Guess what I'm getting at? You can lock the orientation. You can have it that right now my app will work landscape or portrait. That's the default. We can set it to lock our app to only one of those orientations. And eventually, we will lock our app to portrait uh, or landscape. Maybe we're doing a game that will work best in landscape. But just to, just to test it, just to play with it, you could try setting this only to, only to portrait. Then you would save it and deploy it. And then it would update the latest version of the code, and it would have an app only locked in to Portrait. Which one is the option that allows you to see at any shape when you rotate? Say that again. Which is the option that allows when whatever device you're using that the app will go up, uh, you know, you turn it sideways, it will go sideways. It's uh, kind of automatic. Um, if we have this left onto the default, it will change. But also, when we were, remember when we were working on CBDB, we had a line of code at the very top about the viewport. That also is related to that to know, to orient itself properly. Let's see here, full screen. This is set to no. Notice how when I run my device, or when I run my app, at the very top it still has the top bar. The date, the power level and such, because it says full screen no. If I wanted to also take that away to get, to get every centimeter of the screen, I could say yes. I'm not going to change it because usually the only things that do completely full screen are games. And even most games still show you that stuff so that you can keep track of your battery level and such. Domain access, don't worry about it just yet. This is the common screen. We'll further get back to this and change stuff as time goes on. Let's go over to plugins screen. Plugin screen where you add and remove plugins for your app. Right now, we've got a basic web project in the WW folder. It doesn't have any features to, uh, that are trying to access the device. The device has a camera, vibration, sound, uh, compass. GPS. Well, in order for us to be able to tap into the actual hardware of the device, we need plugins. 
And if you scroll through here, here's a plug-in to read the battery level. So once our app detects you're at 10% battery, play a sound, we have that. How we do it is going to be through code, but the, but the way we are able to do it is through a plug-in. So we'll cover these, of course. But let's say, scrolling down, camera. I want to be able to take a photo. So I would need to add the appropriate plugin and write the appropriate code. Now all of this code is Cordova JavaScript code. And we can get directly to it by clicking the link, or we go to the Cordova website. But let's do it this way. Just go to camera, click on it one time. Then on the right description here, click on detailed info. That should open the web browser and take us directly to the official documentation. Notice Visual Studio has its own little web browser here. So I don't even have to leave, leave Visual Studio. But this is going over technically to cordova.apache.org, which I have in the handouts, which I have in the syllabus. But uh, the Cordova website is where I then read how does this plugin work, what do I need to do to use the plugin. And it's just going to be JavaScript code. It's still going to be about creating variables and using functions, but it's going to be very specific methods and objects and so forth. So scrolling down, like the most basic aspect of it, there's a lot of explanation. But eventually, as you scroll down, there's an example right here. Basically, navigator.camera.getPicture, success callback, error callback, options. That's basically the JavaScript command that we need to write. Then our app will be able to take a photo. Cordova, behind the scenes, will translate it into the appropriate code for the appropriate platform. So again, Cordova is the magic that makes it happen. We just need to write the usual HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Cordova will translate it. This documentation is detailed. Notice there's a lot to read about it. So it's not super simple how it works, but it's not like we need to learn how to take a photo in Java and Objective-C and C-sharp and blah, blah, blah. We learn how to do it one time in JavaScript, and then it will translate it. This is the code to take a photo, but then, well, what do I do with the photo? Where do I store it? Do I resize it? Do I put it on screen? Do I put it in a database? That part still we need to expand upon. This is just the raw code. Take a photo with this. Then you have to further write the code about what happens when you successfully take the photo and what happens if there's an error, which of course we'll, we'll cover. Because one of the things CBDB will do is that we will be able to take a photo of our, of our comics and store it in the database. So this opened up a, a web browser here. Go back to config. But any of these plugins we can then further read upon, write the code, do the action. So plugins give you extra features. These plugins that are built in here are the default Cordova plugins with common actions. Mm -hmm. I want to use Bluetooth. I want to check the contacts in the device. I want to access files on the memory card. Well, I want to do other things. I don't see here, for example, a barcode scanner. It's technically not the same as camera. I want to be able to scan a barcode of a comic or a product and read the data in the barcode. So that's when we come to custom plugins. Eventually we'll do this and we will add the link to the custom plugin and install even more features, scanning barcodes, having one device connect to each other via infrared or something, I don't know. There's so many plugins out there to, to, to access the features of a device. And this will tell you what's installed. There's currently one installed. Don't worry about what this is just yet. But here is the plugins screen. 
then we get these screens specific to the devices. If I were going to uh, compile this um, web project to work on Windows devices, here's a spot where I would need to set what's the name of my app on Windows, what's its version, what version of Windows am I targeting? Over here, am I targeting? Because we don't have the Windows code installed. It's not here. In the Windows code, you add it back on my handout number one, where it says, when you install this at home, you have the option to install what types of platforms you're going to create for. In this class, we're focusing on Android, so there's nothing here. On iOS, again, it's very basic because we're not really targeting iOS devices. But since we're targeting Android devices, here we have various Android um, options. We'll get back to these a little later, but these are things we're going to need to set for it to be fully compatible with Android devices. So we'll get back to this. But this config XML file is a very important one. But usually, we only make changes when we first create our project. And then we double check that our settings are correct before we publish our project to the App Store. In between, we don't really have to do much here. You don't really have to change your version numbers every time you edit the app. You just have to set it the, the last time before you publish. General questions on this config XML file? Yes? So <clears throat> when, uh, sometimes when an app wants to have access to your camera, it's going to be sort of built in, actually. That's a good point. Do you, you guys notice sometimes when you download apps and it says, this app would like to use the permissions of your camera. Once we activate one of these features of camera, it sort of will work automatically. We don't have to write anything extra because it will automatically ask the user for that. They will approve it or deny it, and then it'll work. So we don't really have to ask or detect for it. It'll just do it for us. Let's look at this. Go ahead and close the config XML. Now this file is called config.xml. We have index.html, which is code. Does anyone know anything about XML? It's another language like HTML. It's code. But when we double-clicked it, it showed us a nice, pretty interface. Let's do this instead. Right click config XML and then select view code. <clears throat> when we did a double click, that was the same as view designer. But when you do right click view code, it then opens up the raw code. What this shows you here, in my case, 107 lines that represent the same thing that we were looking at in the nice pretty interface. In here, I see line 4. Here's the description. Remember there was a little box that said write your description. Well here it is here also with the description tag open and close. The name of the app. There was a nice little box where I could type the name of the app. Now here it's in the raw code. So I can change it here if I want. When I wrote the, the name of me as, as the author uh, I wrote my name but curiously there wasn't a box to also write your email. However, that it is right here in the raw code. Other stuff here. What version of Android, iOS. Here's the first page, etc. Here's other stuff. So, probably on a future versions that. Uh, the what do they call it the designer the, the, the design view the design view will probably have all of these extra boxes also nicely clickable but behind the scenes this is here but here's something interesting if you noticed when you installed the device I mean the app onto the device and if you went to look at all my apps there is an icon the little Cordova mascot icon is right there. We're going to be able to change that icon, of course. And look at here, line 30. 
for Android devices, here are the icon sizes for the app. For iOS, here are the icons for iOS 8 and 7 and the iPad and so forth. For the platform of Windows, here are the icons. Now when I say here, it's here in the Solution Explorer. Do you see these folder paths? I want to look at the icon LDPI, low DPI, medium DPI, high DPI, extra high DPI. I want to look at the low quality version of the Android icon. Well, this is saying in the res folder, in the icons folder, in the Android folder, you'll find this icon. That's what we're seeing here in the res folder in the icons folder in the android folder you'll find the icons so eventually we're gonna put our own icons there we're gonna design our own icons instead of the generic little Cordova mascot thing so we will spend a little time on in Photoshop too not only do we need to be good or good enough on programming we need to be good or good enough in graphics because we're going to need to do it all the coding and the graphics for our app the the writing of the descriptions and creating the store listing and everything so eventually we're going to change these icons raise your hand if you have any experience in photoshop okay good raise your hand if you believe you have beginning experience in photoshop how do you feel you have intermediate experience in photoshop how do you feel you have expert experience in Photoshop? Okay, good. No one to compete with. Good. Well, that was when you didn't raise your hand. That's the default. When you don't have experience, it's the default. So we're going to have a little bit of experience one day of Photoshop. Obviously, that's gonna, not going to turn you into a Photoshop guru. Our IMCP program perhaps will, or the various classes we offer here will teach you Photoshop. Uh, so if you took those classes, you're going to dust off those skills. If you've never used Photoshop, we're going to touch Photoshop a bit, because I don't want to use that icon. I want to use my own cool icon for my own cool app. Uh, let's do something here. Um, close. Well, before this, there's a whole section here for splash screens platform Android splash as opposed to platform Android icon the icon is the little app icon splash screens uh, does anyone know what know what a splash screen is it's a screen that flashes first before the app starts technically our app says we've got some splash screens that should appear, that should flash before the app starts. And those splash screens are found in the folder res screens android screen hdpi landscape ldpi portrait so notice right here res screens android and then all these different ones. A landscape one of high DPI, high quality. A high DPI quality in portrait. Low DPI landscape, etc. Extra high DPI. The reason there's so many versions is our app will be able to run on, on an older, low DPI, low quality version. So it's got to have its own graphic. And it can run on a newer, higher DPI, higher quality version, so it needs its own graphic too. So we're going to design different sized versions for the different possibilities. Low, high, medium, extra high. And there's the possibility of landscape and portrait. But obviously, if we lock our app to portrait, we don't need to have a landscape splash screen because the app is locked to portrait. Now, the code says to use the splash screen, but I didn't see it. And 
the code says to use the icon, which I do see. But the funny thing is that these splash screens aren't actually active until we add the splash screen plugin. So I want to activate the splash screen plugin to see it. We could do it by writing the code. But instead, let's go back to the nice, safe, pretty design view and just turn it on. So close the config XML code view. Close that. And then you want to right click config XML again, and this time choose view designer. So right click config XML, view designer. Right click it, and then select view designer. We'll go to the plugins screen. It's alphabetical, so let's find splash screen plugin. We have the capability. We've got the we've got the files in the right place, but we don't have the ability to actually use it. So how do you think we? Activate that. Add. Exactly. So right here, click Add. That's going to connect back to the Cordova website. It's going to download the file. It's going to add it to our project. It's then going to say, check mark, we've got it. This plugin is installed. If you want to remove it, obviously, you press Remove. But now from our list of installed plugins, we've got two plugins. Our app got slightly larger because it added a bit more code. But now we have the ability to have a splash screen. So if I were to F5 to run it again, it'll, deep, it'll compile, it'll deploy, it'll convert the code into the appropriate platform, Android. 2.7 seconds and in a moment this will start up whoops this will start up and it'll have a splash screen there it is right there a little spinning and then the app starts so nothing huge or amazing because it wasn't designed very impressively but we got the little spinning and a little icon and splash screen and then the app starts uh, Cordova is ready I put it on lock portrait orientation, so now when I go landscape, it doesn't rotate. That's what I wanted. If you didn't do that, that's fine. But now it's locked to one orientation. I'm going to press stop. Yes? Yes, there's going to be um, a few requirements. Um, older computers often have a harder time to work with this because this software is pretty complex in that it's going to take all of our code, compile it, compress it, etc. So uh, I can't exactly say, like, you need this amount of RAM and you need this memory and all of that. That's kind of like a one-on-one -on -one thing to talk about to see what you particularly have. The short answer is the newer computer, the better. If your computer is older than five years, it might be getting a little bit old to kind of run this well. If it's under two years, it's often newer and better. Obviously, if you have a computer you bought in the last year, even better. And if you go off and buy a computer right now, well, that's the best. But... Uh, not everyone is going to go do that. So if you've got a computer that's you know younger than two years or so, you're often in the best footing for this. Older computers will probably work, but for me where it said it took 2.7 <coughs> seconds, older computers it might take two minutes instead of two seconds. It'll work, but then you have to work, you have to wait ten times longer. And the other consideration is space. And that's not a big consideration because again, eventually our app will be 100 megabytes. Well, hard drives nowadays, like minimum, they come with like, you know what, like 10 gigabytes or not like even even like 500 gigabytes right so capacity wise that's not a big deal it's going to be more about CPU and RAM we can talk about your setup a uh, little more one-on-one -on -one. there's also a consideration of a device if you're going to use your own device the thing that I will say if you've got a device older than Android 4.0 it might not be compatible 
because uh, right now the latest version of Android is like 8, I think, maybe even 9. So it's a pretty old version for even Google themselves are like, you need a new device. So older versions, older than 4, might not quite fully work. Okay. Uh, we already looked in here, the res folder. We saw that in res, I believe it's short for resources. We saw that the icons for our apps are there. The um, splash screens are there. Native, you don't really need to do anything there. I make some notes here. I recommend to replace, we'll do this eventually. When I want my own icon, when I want my own splash screen, the easiest way to do it is to create your own, your own graphics and simply replace the ones that are there, those exact names. If you create a brand new thing called John Icon 123 PNG, you're going to need to change the underlying code to recognize your icon. Don't even bother with that. Instead, we're going to take our icons and replace the existing icons. The code will already be looking for a thing called icon-36-lpi.png, and our icon will replace it, so it'll just take our icon without having to edit any of the code. Because notice, technically, in the config XML, that's what it's, it's saying here. This icon is right here. So if you're going to change I your own icons, you are going to need to go into the icons here, into the raw code, and call it my icon 36. Don't waste your time on that. You're just going to replace the existing icons. And we'll do that eventually. <coughs> WW folder, we've already seen that that's where the majority of our work is going to be. Early on, we're going to perhaps work with the config XML file a bit. We're going to set up our icons in the beginning a bit, but most of the work we're going to do in the class is in the WW folder, in a, in a, web, uh, in a web project. So that's my handout here for anatomy of a project. Any questions on this handout? All right. Let's take our second break. I'm going to put another handout into the folder. We'll get a little bit more hands-on again. Um, and then we'll go on. So it's 8. 05-ish, we'll come back at 8.15 and we'll go on.